Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to those of you joining us online. My name's John. If we haven't met before, I'm one of the pastors on staff. And we're in the second week of a series titled Drive Through Love. You know, we really debated whether or not to do this relationships series in this COVID-19 season. But after praying and, and seeking wise counsel and, and thinking about it ourselves, we really determined that no matter what is happening in the world, we always need help in our relationships. Plus, we're on this global timeout, kind of a forced global timeout. So what better time than now to reflect on the state of our marriages and relationships? Well, today's message is titled, What You Crave, because we all crave things in life and relationships. We all have hopes, dreams, and expectations. And then here's what happens to most of us. When we find the one, we tend to expect that those cravings will then be satisfied. Of course, we also titled this message, What You Crave, based on White Castle's slogan, because what you also crave are White Castle sliders, right? <laughs> My good friend and coworker, Don Grafham, he loves White Castle more than any person that I know. Now, I don't get it. You can decide for yourself what you think about White Castle, but personally, I can't stand it. The smell, the taste, the feeling <laughs> after eating it. Well, our executive pastor, Tyler, and I invited Don out for his birthday lunch. And it wasn't just any birthday. It was his 50th birthday. And Don said, great, that's super generous. I would love to go to my favorite restaurant, White Castle. And we looked right at him like, no, <laughs> we're not taking you there. Every time Don hires a new employee uh, at Eagle Brook, he takes them to White Castle on their first day of employment. Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. Here's a 50 cent slider. Enjoy your career here. 10 years ago, I was one of those new employees. Look how happy I was. <laughs> I'm not faking how miserable I am either. I'm surprised I've made it this far. <laughs> In fact, Don loves White Castle so much that most every Valentine's Day, Don gets a reservation at White Castle and then brings his wife, Kathy, there. Now, you might be thinking, what are you talking about? It's true. Every Valentine's, White Castle takes reservations. They put out fresh linens, uh, decorations, and candles. And then the staff <laughs> dresses up as waiters and waitresses. And Don has been doing this for 22 years. In fact, here's a picture of them from 1997. They're not even married yet. Kathy, do you know what you're getting into? Because here they are, 22 or 23 years later, just this year, celebrating Valentine's Day at White Castle. Now, somehow, they're still happily married. Now, mind you, this is still at a place that serves sliders, okay? They slide right in and right back out the other side. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. There's a lot to psychoanalyze here, okay? But at the core of it, Don craves White Castle, and Kathy, bless her soul, <laughs> satisfies this unique craving of Don's. Let me ask you, what do you crave in your current or future relationships? I mean, maybe you got a list of attributes that make up the perfect, ideal future mate. Or maybe you're married, and you have cravings around more intimacy, more time together, or more help around the house. Every single person brings unique expectations into a relationship. For instance, we have expectations around money, holidays, daily schedules, number of kids that we're going to have. We have expectations around how to parent those kids, career opportunities, time management, and gift giving. Now, nothing wrong with having expectations around any of these or having hopeful outcomes around any of these things. But as you look at this list, are there any of them that have caused conflict ever? I mean, money. <laughs> All couples fight about money. Whether you're going to spend Christmas with Aunt Tammy and her crazy family or at home in your pajamas, whether to have one or five kids and how to discipline those little sinners when they're actually here, 
whether to pursue that career opportunity or not, and on and on the conflict goes. Now, when there's one person who's deciding the outcome of these expectations, easy enough. But when there's two people with two unique sets of expectations around things like money, holidays, and time management, most conflict happens because our expectations aren't being met. I found this to be true in my own relationship with Emily. Uh, I met Emily back in 10th grade. Now, even though I grew up in the state of Washington and Emily grew up in the state of Minnesota, every time I visited my brother and sister-in-law, they were this Emily McNamara's youth pastor. And so I would see this Emily McNamara every time I visited, and we became friends right away. We maintained this friendship all throughout high school and college. We'd communicate via AOL Instant Messenger, call each other on the phone, send each other letters, and we'd see each other about once a year. Well, fast forward eight years uh, to a year out of college, and we had many people in our lives who knew both of us that were praying for us, and in some ways kind of forcing us to start dating. Well, I took an internship out in Minnesota. We started dating within two days, and the rest is history. Now we've been married for 11 years with two kids, but we almost didn't make it. This sounds crazy, but we had a terrible dating relationship, and that led to a rocky first couple years of marriage. Here's why. We had expectations around who the other person was supposed to be and how they were going to fulfill our expectations. See, I expected that Emily was gentle and soft and emotional, and that she wanted to read poetry by the lake. I expected that she wanted me to write her thoughtful love letters and that she'd want to read books on vacation. I expected she was going to prepare dinner every night, that she'd do all the indoor chores just like my mom did, but all the dishes and the laundry. I expected that she would be organized, that she'd be able to keep track of time, and she would always be able to understand what I wanted and when I wanted it. On the other hand, Emily expected that I was going to be tough and rugged and a lot like her dad and his love of hunting and fishing and the outdoors. She expected that I was going to buy her gifts, not write her love letters. She expected that I would know how to change a flat tire if she ever broke down on the side of the road. She expected I knew what she meant when she said three o'clock because she really meant somewhere between like 2.30 and 5.30. She didn't really mean 3 o'clock. She expected that I would always want to talk and talk and talk, that I would never want some alone time or introverted time, and that I would be able to fix something <laughs> if it broke around the house. Well, it turns out our expectations of each other were completely wrong. As we were approaching our wedding, Emily had some bridal showers, and at one of these bridal showers, Emily received a gift card to Victoria's Secret. Now listen, I'm not endorsing Victoria's Secret. Don't send me an email about it. I'm just saying when you're about to get married and your soon-to-be bride comes home and tells you that she got a $100 gift card to Victoria's Secret, there tends to be some potential excitement around that. And my expectation was that Emily was going to buy something Victoria's Secret-y. Instead, when she came home and told me that she bought herself a pair of sweats, I kind of gave her flack about that. I said, why did you buy a pair of sweats at Victoria's Secret? She said, I, I needed a comfortable pair of sweats. I said, go to Walmart and buy five pairs of sweats. Don't buy that at Victoria's Secret. What are you doing? Here's the definition of expectations. Expectations are the things we assume will come to be. Now, going back to the list that we looked at earlier, money, holidays, daily schedules, number of kids, how to parent those kids, careers, and how to navigate all that, daily schedules, and gift-giving. As you look at this list, rather than thinking in the past tense, ask yourself, is there one of these that is causing current or ongoing tension in your relationship. It's more than likely because you had an expectation that has gone unfulfilled or unexpressed. Scripture says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? 
I mean, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. Obviously, we don't want to reach an outcome where you, where you end up wanting to kill each other. But these unfulfilled expectations have the potential to destroy our relationships. So the question is, what are we supposed to do with all these expectations? We all have them. They're all uniquely different. And we all tend to hope the other person in our lives will fulfill them. Well, I'm not an expert on marriage by any means. God's word has some principles that have made a significant difference in our own relationship. And as we apply these principles, our relationships will be filled with unconditional love and gratitude. I mean, isn't that what we all want? So to navigate expectations in our relationships, apply these four principles. And the first principle is this, eliminate the debt, and I don't mean financially. You know, oftentimes we approach an expectation as if that person owes us something. I mean, you owe me time alone, dinner out, a better house, time with my friends. And with that kind of mentality, if I don't get what I want from you, I'm going to be hurt by you because you owe me. And then with that kind of mentality, even if your significant other fulfills one of your expectations that they owe you, how much credit do they actually get? Not much. I mean, how grateful are you if they fulfill the thing that they're simply paying back to you? Not much at all. It was a debt. They're breaking even. They're getting back to par. But that's what happens when you carry this expectation as if they owe you something. It creates a debt-debtor relationship. Scripture says it this way. Owe nothing to anyone. Nothing. Except for your obligation to love one another. They don't owe you anything. And you don't know, owe them anything. Except for love. So it's time to eliminate the debt. Now what does this mean practically speaking? It means you can have expectations. Of course. But you aren't starting below zero or par. You're even. There's no debt to pay off. And with no debt, you can communicate these expectations more positively towards hope and wish and dream. And then if your significant other fulfills the expectation, you feel so much gratitude. And if they don't, one or both people can still thrive because, again, you're even. There's no debt. So instead of saying or thinking, you owe me, it's time to start saying and thinking, you don't owe me anything. In fact, next time you're with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your imaginary boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, you turn to them and say, you don't owe me anything. And if they haven't watched this message, they won't know what you're talking about, but say it anyways Eliminate the debt. Second principle to navigate expectations is to clothe yourselves with humility. See, relationships will fail and die when one or both people refuse to address and talk about expectations. Why is it so hard? It's because these conversations require so much humility. I mean, to tell someone what you want and expect should be fairly easy. But let me pause on that for a second. Have you clearly and calmly communicated your expectations? Sometimes we think we have. Sometimes we feel like we have. Sometimes we've yelled our expectations at them. But have you calmly and clearly articulated your expectations, because if you haven't, start there. But it's much more difficult to listen, especially when you might not be meeting the expectations of another person. I mean, how many of us actually like to hear where we're falling short? No one likes that kind of feedback. That's why one of the absolute keys to all healthy relationships 
is this word humility. Peter says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And then get this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is a scriptural promise. God opposes pride, but he fills our relationships with supernatural grace to relationships that are filled with humility. Without humility, we can't actually admit we need to work on something and hear where we might be falling short. I'm telling you, marriages fail and die when one or both people refuse to talk about expectations because it shows they lack humility. That's why for the last several years, whenever we go on a date, Emily and I ask each other this question. What can I do better for you? In other words, Emily, am I being the kind of husband that you want and expect me to be? I'm inviting her to speak about her expectations of me as a husband and a father and a man, and she's doing the same for me. Well, one Saturday night, when I asked her this question, she had a list of not one or two, but five things that I could be doing better. And I was like, did I have a bad week or have you been storing these up for a while? But as she sat there and listed these five things that I could improve on, I sat there and I listened. And I didn't get defensive. I didn't get angry. In fact, I wrote them down on my phone. Now, did it hurt? You ever have an ingrown toenail ripped out? It's a very similar feeling. No one likes to hear how they're falling short. But I sat there and I listened and I determined to improve on those five areas. Now, let me be clear. This has taken a lot of practice. There have been so many times where one of us has shared something, got defensive, and then we fought like crazy about it. And that'll happen to us in the future. The reason I share a positive example is to tell you, you can get there too. It takes practice. It takes practice to ask each other this question, what can I do better for you? But as you do, pride will decrease and humility will increase. So next time you have an opportunity, turn to your spouse and say, what can I do better for you? And as you do, you are opening the door to talk about expectations in a humble way. Third principle to navigate expectations is this. It's to submit to one another because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually listen. It's a whole other thing to respond. That's why Paul writes to wives and husbands, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, here's a really hot button word in today's society. Submission. I mean, real quick. You think submission has a positive or negative connotation in our current culture? Yeah, it's not great. How many of us would say that one of the top things we're so excited about to be married to for someone is the opportunity to submit to them? <laughs> not many of us. And I think one of the reasons that submission gets such a bad rap is because culture has incorrectly defined the meaning of submission. See, culture will tell you that submission means someone else removes your value. But that's not the biblical definition of submission. See, the biblical definition of submission is that it means to give someone else value. See, to satisfy a God-honoring, healthy expectation from your spouse, whether it's to do the laundry listen to a long-winded story, or just show up on time. The reason I do that is to show Emily how much I value her. And notice, Paul doesn't say submit to one another because they're so great, because they earned it, because you owe them, because they're so hot. No, Paul doesn't say that. He says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does Paul mean? He means that Christ is the ultimate example of submission. Christ laid down his life selflessly to satisfy the deepest needs 
and desires in our own life. He was beaten, bloodied, and crucified for our sin. I mean, that's why Paul writes, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. So why should we submit to one another? Out of reverence for what Christ has done for you and me. And then here's the beautiful thing that happens with submission. Submission encourages submission. In other words, when I submit to one of Emily's expectations of me, she then becomes motivated to submit to one of my expectations of her. Submission moves the flywheel. Great relationships should be a competition to outserve one another. It's a race to the back of the line. I mean, you say you do anything for your spouse, but will you just put down the phone when she wants to talk? You say you do anything for your spouse, but will you let him watch three hours of uninterrupted sports time? And yes, that game happened in 1991, and yes, you know the outcome, but even if you can't stand it, will you just let him watch those three hours of sports? Will you be the first to go change that diaper, go clean up the kitchen or do the laundry. Now, the danger in all of this that you might be tempted to keep score. I mean, I submitted four times this week. She submitted three. It's her turn. And I'm begging you, no scorecards in relationships, none. And don't submit to the other person so that they'll eventually submit to you. That's not healthy submission. That's just owing something to someone. But when you meet another person's expectations, do so out of reverence for Christ, who submitted to death and resurrection. He gave up his life for you. Now, to be clear, there are times when submission is not the right thing to do. For example, you should never submit in abusive relationships. Some spouses, particularly men, will use this idea of submission in a very unhealthy and unbiblical way to guilt women into staying into abusive relationships. I saw a statistic recently that said domestic violence has increased by 25% since this coronavirus season because we're all stuck at home. And if you are one of those women, let me beg of you, get help. Tell someone, don't submit to that kind of evil. Find shelter. And men, you are married to a daughter of God. Get on your face and confess your sin. Your time on earth is short before you'll be called to account. Submission also doesn't mean that we agree on everything. For example, there might be times when your spouse doesn't have faith in Christ, doesn't want to go to church, especially when it comes to matters of faith. Submit to God's will above what your spouse wants. But when you're in a relationship with someone who is expressing God-honoring healthy expectations, race to the back of the line and be the first to submit to the other person. Final principle to navigate expectations is this. Cast your anxieties on God. I got to tell you, that, that Tom Cruise in Jerry Maguire was full of crap. <laughs> there is no one person who will ever complete you. There is no one person who will ever fulfill all of your expectations. That's why there are going to be days Weeks, even seasons where you wonder, is this all worth it? That's why Peter writes this. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. There are going to be times and seasons where you are the only one who is meeting expectations. You are the only one who is submitting. 
And all the while, you're wondering, when are you gonna get your due? When are your expectations going to be met? The reality is, it might be a while. So what are you supposed to do in the meantime? Well, Peter continues, he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When you feel like you're never going to get out of the season that you're in and your expectations aren't going to be met, cast your anxieties on God. And in due time, God's power will fill your marriage, your spouse, and your expectations. But listen, John, my wife does not cook. (laughs) He is not gonna clean the kitchen. He wants to read books on vacation. She wants to spend money on a bathroom renovation. She doesn't want thoughtful love letters. She doesn't even want gifts. She just wants cold, hard cash. Every birthday and Christmas and Mother's Day and Earth Day, (laughs) Memorial Day, that's what I have to submit to. She's good with just straight up cash. Do I really need to keep submitting to him when all he wants to do is go to White Castle on Valentine's Day? I mean, how long do I need to wait for my wishes, my expectations to be met? Well, I don't have any easy answers. Peter has a solution, and it's to cast, to put, to place, to tell God, your anxieties, when you're feeling like it's not gonna happen, when you pray and pray and pray to find the one, and you go on date after date after date, it's just one failed attempt after another, when you're feeling like you're the only one submitting and you're the only one working on your relationship, when you're facing another day of working from home or being furloughed, and navigating this season at home with your kids. I mean, who has time to work on their marriage and relationship? Peter says, cast your anxieties on God. And in due time, God's power will lift you up. I mentioned this earlier, but we had a really terrible dating relationship, so much so that when we showed up to one of our pre-marriage counseling sessions, we had taken one of those marriage assessments (laughs) And the pastor sat us down and said, John and Emily, I have never seen a couple score this low on conflict resolution ever. In fact, if I didn't know both of you, I would probably tell you to wait to get married. And we're like, thank you, pastor. We're so looking forward to this. This is going to be just great. But the truth is we stunk at conflict resolution. That's because anytime one of us got heated, it was virtually impossible to submit to the other person's conflict resolution style. Emily wanted to go go to bed and talk about it in the morning. I wanted to hash it out right then and there. The truth is, we were terrible at conflict resolution because we also had so much conflict. And there were moments, I know, specifically Emily, where she just had to cast her anxieties on God over and over and over again. While we aren't perfect when it comes to conflict, we are night and day different. One, we've done the work, but two, God's power has lifted us up as we've casted our anxieties on him. A couple months ago, we went on a date to London Byerly's, which is a local grocery store supermarket here in Minnesota. This is prior to the COVID-19 uh, season. And I know it sounds really luxurious and exciting, but have you ever had their salad and buffet bar? It's pretty great. As we were finishing up this date, which honestly wasn't anything special, we needed to go buy some Manchego cheese for dinner that we were preparing the next night. Now, Manchego is this sheep's cheese and uh, it's a great alternative for people who don't eat dairy. Well, the stuff we found at London Barley's was way too small and way too expensive, and we knew there was a much larger, cheaper version at Costco. So on the way out the door, I said to Emily, let's go to Costco and find some cheap sheep's cheese. But instead of saying it correctly, I said, let's go to Costco and find some sheep cheap's cheese. <laughs> and for whatever reason, 
Emily loves it when I mess up this way. And she doubled over right there in the store and started cackling. And then for the next 10 minutes, we were driving over to Costco and we were trying to say cheap sheep's cheese as fast as possible over and over and over again. We were laughing so hard. We were in tears. And Emily has this adorable chipmunk laugh that just lights up a space. It lights up a room. And I still remember hearing that laugh for the first time way back in 10th grade. And as we were driving over to Costco saying cheap sheep's cheese over and over again, I thought to myself, I wouldn't trade this time for anything. Emily's my best friend. Marriage with her just keeps getting better and better. It doesn't mean we're perfect. We have our problems, but we are on an upwards trajectory. Most of all, because we know there is no quick silver bullet. There is no quick drive-through solutions to healthy, God-honoring, thriving marriages. That's why we apply these principles. Start here. No matter what your relationship status is, eliminate the debt. They don't owe you anything. Clothe yourself with humility. What can I do better for you? Submit to one another. Race to the back of the line. And then cast your anxieties, not on your spouse or your future, but cast your anxieties on God because in due time, God's power will fill your marriage. it will fill your future relationships. To close, I've asked the band to sing a song that has been really meaningful for me in the last several months. And it's a song that is a blessing. And it's a blessing that I want you to receive today. Because whether you are single or happily married, whether you're on the brink of divorce, let me pause right now and say, there are some of you who are so close to that ledge. You're on the brink. And I believe in faith that God is gonna pull you back. He's gonna pull you back from that brink of divorce. And there are some of you who've been recently divorced. I've got a few friends who I'm thinking of right now. No matter your status right now, I want you to hear this message loud and clear. That God is for you. He is with you. And so as you listen to this song, I want you to know that God wants to bless you. He wants you to be blessed through your marriage. He wants your kids to be blessed through your marriage. He wants their kids to be blessed and on and on for generations to come. And that will happen if God is in it. So as we take in this song, I'm asking God to bless our families, to bless your marriages, to bless your kids through your marriage. God is with you. He is for you. May God bless you and keep you.
truth today. So Jesus, would you help us accept this? This is your blessing and we can grab hold of it, God. We do not need to listen to the lie that it is not true. God, your love is real. It is powerful and it's waiting for us and we can accept that our family and our children will be blessed because they know you, Jesus. So we love you. We sing this because we love you, God. We worship you. Amen. Hi, I'm Roz, and I just want to give you a moment to take the lyrics of that song in. When I hear them, I am reminded of God's magnitude, of his love for us, that he is all around us and he is for us. And I want you to know that we are here for you too. We want to continue to encourage you during this shelter in place season. And we've got something special for you next week. We are actually gonna bring you two messages, that's right. We're taking advantage of Church Online and we're gonna use the technology to bring you one message that's specifically for people who are married and another message that's specifically for people who are not. So you get to choose which message is right for your season in life. It's gonna be great. I can't wait for you to watch it, so invite someone to join you. 
Now, speaking of checking out things online, we have great places for you to stay connected with us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and our handle is at EagleBrookMN. Now, if social media is just not your thing, that's okay too. We get it. We have a webpage for you, and that's eaglebrookchurch.com slash connect. It's a great way to stay connected to us and find wonderful resources. Now, if you need prayer, that is our honor to provide to you. And so we hope that you will put your requests in our Facebook group, or you can email them to us at online at eaglebrookchurch.com. But we would love to care for you in that way. So please send those in if you have them. All right, thanks for joining us online. I am so glad that you made this part of your day today. Way to go. We love you. We're going to continue to be here praying for you. We will see you back next week. So join us online and take care until then, friends.